The topic of today's video is a spondylolysis, also known as a pars defect or an adult ismic spondylolisthesis. But before I explain what a spondylolysis is, I'm gonna go over the anatomy of the lumbar spine briefly. The lumbar spine is composed of five vertebral bodies, and when you look at these from the side, they look like boxes. Each one of these bones is separated from the bone above and below it by a cushion or a disc. Now each bone sends two processes up and two down, and then they're connected to the bone above and below by joints. If the two processes going down have a defect, that's called a spondylolysis. This spondylolysis can allow instability, and that instability can allow one bone to slip on the other bone. This slippage is called a spondylolisthesis. There are five categories of pathologies which can lead to a spondylolisthesis. These include congenital abnormalities. You can be born with something which um, can lead to instability where one bone will slip on the other one. Cancer can eat away part of the bone. You can have degenerative changes where the joints wear out and one bone will slip on the other one. You can have fractures in other locations in the spine that can allow one bone to slip on the other. Or you can have a fracture in the pars, which is called a spondylolysis, which is the topic of today's video. Now these pars fractures are divided into three different types. You can have a stress fracture, which is a repetitive injury. You can have an elongation fracture, or you can have an acute fracture. All of these fractures are caused by some type of trauma. It can be micro trauma, or it can just be typical trauma. In the overall population, roughly four to 6% has a defect in the PARS. This is more common in people that engage in activities that place hyperextension, bending back type forces on the lower back, such as gymnasts, football linemen, weightlifting. And it has to do with the fact that as you get lower in the back, there's more of an angle and more stress on those vertebral bodies. So 85% of these occur at L5, 10% occur at L4, and then 5% are distributed throughout the rest of the spine. 5% of patients who have a spondylolysis will develop a spondylolisthesis. It's more common in females and it's more common when there is still growth left. If you're an adult, if you've reached skeletal maturity, it's much less likely to develop a spondylolisthesis from a spondylolysis. Now, spondylolisthesis are categorized according to how far they've slipped. A grade one slips 25%, a grade two spondylolisthesis is 50%, three is 75%, four is 100%, and a grade five spondylolisthesis is where it's slipped completely off. Symptoms come from one of three locations. Either the fracture itself can cause pain, and that typically causes pain in the back. As the fracture tries to heal, it can close off the area where the nerve comes out and you can get nerve pain called radiculopathy. At the L5 level, that's usually the L5 nerve that causes pain in the back, buttock, down the leg called sciatica. And the L5 nerve goes to the muscles that pull up the foot and the big toe and can lead to what's known as drop foot. In some cases, much less common, you can close off the entire spinal canal. That's called spinal stenosis and can lead to neurogenic claudication. And in very rare cases, you can develop a syndrome known as cauda equina, which is where you lose control of bowel and bladder habits. A spondylolysis is most commonly picked up on a plain x-ray. If you look at the oblique x-ray, it kind of looks like a Scotty dog. We do bending films, flexion extension films, to measure the amount of instability. Four degrees of translation or 10 degrees of angulation is considered to be excessive 
instability and indicates a high probability that there's going to be breakdown of the disc and problems. We can also take x-rays of a patient's pelvis and there are certain angles that are always standard throughout someone's life and by measuring these angles we see that the pelvic slope plus the pelvic tilt is equal to the pelvic incident and we can determine what the patient's original disc height and size was prior to the slippage. So that becomes very important when we're doing rebuilding type surgeries. Another study we will use is a CT scan. A CT scan is just a very special x-ray. It gives us a better ability to see the anatomy of the fracture itself. We can tell if it's an old fracture, a new fracture. We can see if it's healing, or if we try to fuse it, we can see if it's fused. MRI studies are used because it is really the only study that we have that allows us to look directly at the nerves. We can see if the nerves are being pinched, which side's being pinched. We can see if we have herniated discs at other levels, and we can see spinal stenosis. The treatment is divided into two different types. You have non-operative and operative. Many times non-operative begins with bracing if it's a fracture. Uh, some, we will use oral medications. Uh, sometimes we'll suggest lifestyle changes. If you are, for example, a football lineman, we set, may decide that that's not the best lifestyle for you. We use physical therapy for spinal stabilization, strengthening exercises. And if somebody has enough pain, we will use pain management and epidural injections. If all of those conservative treatment options have failed, then we consider surgical intervention. The first thing the surgeon has to decide is what he's going to fix. In a very young patient, it may be possible to repair the PARS itself. And that's somebody who's 25, 30 years or younger. If it's more advanced, the L5-S1 di disc may have broken down, we'll have to fuse that level. Or if it's even been longer, then what happens as five slips, you also get breakdown at four or five, and we may wind up having to fuse four, five, and S1. Another decision is do we reduce the spondylolisthesis? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, and that has to, and one of the problems with reducing it is you could develop problems with the L5 nerve. Once you've decided what you're gonna fix, then you have to decide upon the approach. And the most common approach used is the posterior approach. It's the one that most surgeons know, they're most comfortable with, it's the ones they, one they do most often. It has the advantage of giving you direct visualization of the nerves. Um, you can put screws in the bones and reduce the vertebral bodies, get good overall alignment, and you can put cages in the disc space. Another approach is where we go anterior. The advantage of an anterior approach is, going in front, you have better access to the vertebral bodies themselves, you can put a bigger disc in, therefore it's easier to get restoration of normal height and alignment. Also, the bones are in the front, so you have more bone-on-bone -bone contact, and so the rates of fusion are much higher. One of the downsides is the fact that in males you can get retrograde ejaculations. Um, and then another way to fix it is a combination of the two where you do anterior and posterior. This has both the advantages and disadvantages of both. Now, any one of these procedures can be done using minimally invasive techniques. Here at the El Paso Spine Center, we do a 360 endoscopic lumbar spinal fusion. It is the least invasive, most advanced technique used for repairing a spondylolisthesis and a pars defect. If you'd like more information on this, we do have videos that are shot in the operative suite uh, that uh, gives you the uh, the opportunity to see the surgery basically through the eyes of the surgeon. It starts from the time I wash my hands until I do the last stitch. Um, 
If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like. If you have any suggestions for any other videos, please leave that in the comments below and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. Thanks.